This video demonstrates a complete resection of a pontine cavernous small formation through an endoscopic and nasal transplival approach. A 46 old lady presented sudden diplopia and right hemiparesis 10 years ago with complete neurological recovery, followed by five more episodes of mild right hemiparesis. The last episode occurred six months before the surgical procedure. The MRI suggested a cavernous malformation in the pons with an esophytic portion in the prepontine cistern, and the decision was made to take the patient to the operating room for a section of the lesion through an endoscopic endonasal transclival approach. The patient was positioned supine with the head slightly turned to the right side and tilted to the left, fixed in a manfield head pins. The middle and superior turbinates were resected bilaterally. A nasal septal flap was made in the left nostril and positioned in the nasopharynx. A reverse flap was made on the right side. After extensive opening of the sphenoid sinus, we drilled the septations to expose the middle clivus between the paraclival carotid arteries below the cella. The middle clivus was removed to expose the dura of the posterior fossa. We planted a left paramedian incision to avoid the basilar artery in the midline and the absent nerve laterally. Doppler ultrasound and direct electrical stimulation were used. Bleeding from the basilar plexus was controlled with gelatin hemostatic matrix. A vertical incision was made and we visualized the esophytic portion of the cavernous malformation in contact with the basilar artery. The cavernous malformation was carefully dissected from the basilar artery and its branches. The incision of the dura was enlarged laterally and the resection of the lesion was started in piecemeal. Microsurgical techniques were adopted in the same way they would be used in traditional microsurgical approaches. The peripheral portions of the lesion were pulled into the center of the surgical cavity. Most of the time, resection was performed by traction with a grasping forceps and counter-traction with a suction tube. The pontine tissue with hemosiderin was maintained on surgical borders. Careful dissection of pontine arterial branch was performed. Removal of the lesion proceeded in piecemeal. A large clot in the lateral portion of the lesion was mobilized and removed.
the last piece of lesion was removed and the pontine parenchyma with hemosiderin was inspected. The surgical cavity was covered with oxidized cellulose hemostatic agent. The reconstruction was performed with an inlay and a non-lay fascia lata, followed by fat and the positioning of the nasal septal flap. A Foley catheter was used to maintain the position of the nasal septal flap. There was a slight worsening of right hemiparesis in the postoperative period. The patient presented CSF leak on the sixth postoperative day, which was corrected the same day with a surgical revision. We noted that the pulsation of the basilar artery displaced the layers of fascia lata. These layers were repositioned and fibrin glue was used to prevent further displacement. Fat and the nasal septal flap were repositioned, followed by the Foley catheter. A lumbar drain was implanted. A MRI performed after six months of surgery showed cicatricial alterations in the surgical borders with contrast enhancement, but no obvious residual lesion. There was a complete resolution of the motor deficit. We decided to propose surgical treatment since the patient presented multiple episodes of bleeding and the new episode could be catastrophic. Traditional approaches were considered retrosigmoid craniotomies, anterior petrosectomies, and presigmoid approaches are some options. All of them expose the lateral portion of the pons and allow access to safe entry zones, such as the peritrigeminal zone and the middle cerebellar peduncle zone. However, manipulation through the pontine parenchyma is required and there is a risk of injury to eloquent areas, especially because there is important displacement of the normal structures, making anatomical recognition difficult. Also, the surgical corridor is narrow in a lateral route between the cranial nerves. We opted for an endoscopic endonasal transclival approach since it provides direct access to the ventral region of the pons and would allow us to access the lesion without having to cross the pontine parenchyma. The biggest disadvantage of this approach is the CSF leak rate, which is still higher than in traditional approaches. However, the advancement of surgical techniques has reduced its rate, and even when it occurs, it is most often treated with revision of the reconstruction. We have shown the resection of a cavernous malformation in the ventral pons with a good functional outcome, and we believe that this case may reinforce the idea that the endonasal transclival approach is a good option for selected cases.